right, well, welcome and thank you for joining us for the third webinar in this year's Virtual Visiting Scholar webinar series. I'm Virginia Rhodes, the project director for the ARC Network. We're very excited to host the third and final presentation from cohort four of the Virtual Visiting Scholars program. This program empowers scholars to complete metasyntheses and meta-analyses of existing literature to address critical issues relevant to equity and STEM. Now, before we introduce today's speaker, I would like to take care of a few housekeeping items. First, I want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded, and we will share the recording with registrants and post it to our ARC Network website for later, uh, for later viewing. Live captioning is also available through Zoom. If you hover your mouse over the bottom of the Zoom window, you'll see a number of different menu options. To the right is the icon for captioning. Selecting the carrot will allow you to customize your captioning. In the center are options for Q&A and chat. For the beginning of our webinar, you'll only be able to view chat messages from the ARC team. We'll also be using the chat to share links to resources and our feedback survey at the end. We'll open the chat for participants once we finish with the prompted part of today's discussion. And if you have any questions for the speaker, please add them to the Q&A, where you can also upvote questions that resonate with you. Next, we have ARC Network's PI and Director of Research of our home organization, WePAN, Heather Metcalf, who will share more about who we are as the ARC Network and introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Virginia. Hi, everyone. So glad to see so many people here for our webinar today. Um, just to share a bit of background about the ARC Network, uh, we are funded by the National Science Foundation's Advanced Program. We aim to build on advanced program efforts and connect widely dispersed scholars and practitioners committed to STEM equity in an engaged stakeholder community. As the STEM Equity Brain Trust, the ARC Network works to promote systemic change by collecting previous work and producing new perspectives, methods, and interventions through a variety of activities, including convenings, a curated resource library, emerging research workshops, our virtual visiting scholar program and online events like this one. The ARC network is built on and works through a framework integrating inclusion, intersectionality and intentionality. We strive to ensure that our work accounts for the social stratifications that intertwine to determine unique inequities that folks experience. The Women in Engineering Proactive Network or WePAN serves as our home organization. To learn more about the ARC Network, we encourage you to visit equityandstem.org, where you can also join the community if you haven't already. You can also find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at ARC Equity and STEM and hashtag Equity and STEM. Now for why we're here today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. We're joined by Dr. Don Kioi Culpepper. Um, who uses she, hers pronouns and is the associate director and an assistant research professor at the University of Maryland's Advanced Program for Inclusive Excellence. Dr. Culpepper's research broadly examines diversity, equity, and inclusion in the academic workplace. She focuses on policies, practices, and resources that foster equity, disrupt bias, spur organizational effectiveness, and create conditions where women and BIPOC scholars can thrive. She has held leadership roles on several NSF funded projects, including the Faculty Workloads and Rewards Project funded by NSF Advance, and Social Science Research on Faculty Hiring um, funded by NSF AGEP. Dr. Culpepper leverages research to inform practice, leaning faculty development and educational initiatives across UMD's campus. She completed her BA in government at the University of Virginia, her MED in Higher Education Administration at NC State University, and her PhD in Higher Education at the University of Maryland. It's my pleasure to welcome Don to our webinar today. Thanks, Heather. Um, should I start sharing now? All right. Um, so while I, oops, let's see. while I get these on up and hopefully everybody can see those. Um, I wanted to say thanks again to Heather for the introduction and also to Virginia, Stephanie, Ursula, um, Joan, and, and all the others involved with the ARC Network and, and WePAN for their support of, their, of this work. Um, so before I officially get started, I wanted to recognize that I think that this webinar was initially billed as um, applying intersectional perspectives to bystander interve intervention trainings. 
Um, but you will see here on this slide and in the report that this project actually ended up being a bit broader. Um, so that is rather than only looking at faculty bystander development or intervention programs, I um, expanded to consider a wider range of faculty development programs. Um, so, you know, as researchers, we know that our questions naturally morph over the course of an inquiry, and that was very much the case um, in this particular review. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that from the beginning in case there was any confusion about the kind of scope and emphasis of this work um, somewhere down the line. Um, so anyhow, uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started um, again. Don Culpepper, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and as Heather mentioned, I'm currently a professor at the University of Maryland with our advanced program for inclusive excellence. Um, and indeed the advanced program and my work there truly served as the motivation for this work. So um, that's where I'm gonna start out uh, kind of discussing how I came to this project. Um, so our advanced program um, under the leadership of Dr. Carrie Ann O'Meara uh, in the 2010s um, initiated, had initiated a bystander development workshop um, in 2016-2017, um, and this was directly informed by the work of Dr. Stephanie Goodwin, um, who, if you're here, uh, Dr. Goodwin, hello. Um, who I know has inspired much of the work in this area. Um, and we were also informed by other programs like the ones at the University of Michigan, UMass Lowell, um, and others who have been, um, you know, deeply engaged with this work over the, over the years. Um, and so we called our program uh, the TERP Allies Program, and the goals were to um, increase awareness of the prevalence and implications of social bias, especially in higher education work settings, um, identify strategies and actions that individuals can take to respond to social bias as it happens, uh, and grow the number of bystanders who feel confident in and who are committed to responding to bias when it happens. Um, so since 2017, our advanced program has done about 30 of these workshops. And of course, in 2020, we shifted a lot of this work online. Um, I actually did uh, our first in-person workshop like four to six weeks ago, and it was so fun to be back um, in a room with folks um, doing this work. Um, and, and we've worked with about 400 faculty, staff, and students. Uh, most of the time we do workshops within a department or a college. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we've done these online and in person over the years. Um, and our internal evaluation results have shown that the workshop has positive effects. So overall, we found over time that participants um, report greater awareness of social bias in the workplace um, and greater comfort with intervening in situations that involve social bias. So, you know, as I said, I've done, you know, about 30 or so of these workshops over the years. And as a workshop facilitator, I kind of keep a running tab of common questions or issues that come up in these workshops. Um, and, and some of the common kind of feedback or questions that I get are things like, what's the difference between an ally and a bystander? Um, other participants in a workshop might comment something like, well, I'm a non-tenure track faculty member and I'm also a woman or I'm a black woman, or I'm a gay man, um, you know, how do I intervene? What should I do when I'm on the receiving end of bias? How do, you know, these general kind of comments or questions about how do, how do my positionality shape um, the way that I can be effective in, in these kinds of situations? Um, and then last, you know, often people will comment um, things like, yes, we need people who can speak out in the moment, um, but we also really need advocates who are going to, you know, agitate for change at, at a college or an institutional level, um, and particularly changes, you know, on, on the policy end that are going to help um, kind of cement some of these institutional practices and the inclusion that we're hoping to promote um, in, in the bystander work. And so, um, 
you know, I, I was, I've received these comments and tried to take note of them and, um, you know, over the years have developed some better answers. Um, but so part of part of the purpose of this project was to really have a better sense of, of how to respond to these things um, to the benefit of, of the folks who were in the workshops that I've done. You know, at the at the same time um, as I've received these questions, the context in which we engage in this kind of bystander intervention or ally development work has really changed. Um, so, of course, institutions have made a lot of promises regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion since 2020 um, and the protest for racial justice. Um, which in some ways have perhaps enhanced our awareness of structural racism and intersectional intersectional inequities. Um, and in response to this, um, in some uh, places, there has been a greater emphasis on kind of equity advocate programs and other attempt attempts to engage people in privileged positions, often white men in academia, um, in diversity, equity, and inclusion related work. Um, in the literature, I've also observed an enhanced understanding um, that uh, when we're thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, the strategies that might promote kind of inclusion and belonging in one area, for example, gender equity, might not be immediately transferable to other areas like racial equity or disability access and inclusion, um, as well as an increased call um, for proven interventions, or really the you know ability to contextualize bystander work and, and other DEI related um, work, um, and and map it on to um, to progress in terms of outcomes. So you know being able to say, well, we really we participated in this workshop or this program, and it has moved the needle on issues that are important to us, like climate retention, other e equity issues that our institutions face. Um, so these are the contexts that I was really thinking about as I put in my um, uh, proposal for the VBS program, um, very much a practitioner focus and wanting to be able to answer questions and I received them. Um, and then also a kind of researcher's suspicion that if I looked outside of the faculty development literature, I might get some more insights um, that would help me kind of improve program, but also translate that and, and help others who want to engage in this work um, develop curriculum um, in meaningful ways. So with that background in mind, I had two questions that informed my inquiry. Um, my first one was how, if at all, do faculty, ally, bystander, or advocate, so I came to call these ABA because um, ally, bystander, advocate <laughs> it was, a, it was a mouthful. Um, so how do ABA programs center intersectional systems of power and oppression in program curricula? Um, and so back to my earlier point, I focused here on programs where faculty members were being charged to act in, on, um, on behalf of some kind of equity issue among their colleagues. Um, so not on behalf of students or kind of student issues um, and not programs where faculty members were being trained on some issues such as implicit bias. Um, but really a program or a study or a conceptual paper where faculty members were, spe were specifically being discussed as agents who were taking some kind of action within their relevant context. Um, my second research question um, was, again, that kind of translational piece, um, which was how might insights from sociology, social psychology, behavioral economics, social justice education, um, and other disciplines be applied to center and in intersectionality in faculty ABA programs. Um, so again, in this question, I really wanted to understand um, what about allyship and bystander intervention could be drawn into the faculty work um, to help me and others be more prepared, um, develop better curriculum, um, and I really wanted to be multidisciplinary in, in my approach. So as you could tell from the research questions, um, my study was guided by the concept of intersectionality or the assumption that organization of power in a given society is shaped not by a single access of social division, um, such as race, gender, or class, but by the many axes that work together and influence each other. Um, and as I considered intersectionality, as a conceptual frame, there were really five components that really um, informed my, my thinking and my review. 
Um, so first is, of course, the recognition that inequalities manifest and persist at the intersection of social identities, including but not limited to gender, race, and sexual orientation. Uh, second is recognizing that individual experiences with bias are a reflection of structural and interlocking systems of oppression that are present in academia, but also outside of it. Third is that intersectionally really helps us understand those structural and interlocking systems of oppression, but also um, locations of power and privilege and how those may play out um, in different contexts. And speaking of context, um, you know, fourth is, is really understanding that there are aspects of oppression, power, and privilege that exist no, no matter what kind of organization you're in, um, but also unique manifestations of these issues within academia that might vary based on discipline, um, institution, appointment type, and these kinds of social roles that we have within our academic um, organizations. Um, last, and, and again, really importantly, are aspects of fluidity and relationality. Um, and so this is really the idea that the that one could be a bystander or an ally in one situation, um, and also recognizing that they may be a perpetrator or a target in another, and that these positionalities may shift quickly, um, you know, over the course of a meeting, over a course of the day. Um, and so having that kind of intersectional awareness can help um, um, uh, position us within uh, the bystander and faculty development work. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to review my methods in depth, they're in the report, um, but I undertook a systematic review of the literature, um, collected articles from 20 days, databases focused on gender, race and gender studies, and the social sciences. Um, for research question one, I was specifically looking at articles um, on faculty development and search for articles that use the word bystander, ally, or advocate in the title or the keyword. Um, and I ended up with 28 articles. And then for research question two, um, which was a, a, a lot more unwieldy, um, I went into the non-faculty development literature, um, again, scanning for articles that use the word bystander, ally, or advocate. Um, and, I, and I'll note here, just in case it comes up, um, that over the course of the scan, I ended up dropping the word advocate from my search for research question two, because most of the studies of advocacy ended up being about more about laws and legal advocacy um, in ways that weren't immediately translatable to this particular project, though, you know, again, learn, learn some things. Um, but those weren't included in this particular project. All right, so as I come into my results, um, I'm going to break down some of the descriptive results really quickly. Um, so for research question one, which again focused on the faculty development literature, I found 28 articles. Um, 50 of those studies examined gender equity, 32% examined racial equity, and 14% had a more kind of general equity or diversity ally or advocate approach. 46% um, of the articles talked about engaging men as allies, um, while 25% talked about engaging white faculty or administrators, um, and 14% of the articles in this review used an intersectional um, framework. 32% uh, of the studies named faculty members as allies, 18% talked about faculty members as bystanders, 14% as advocates, and 29% um, use one or more of the terms, um, sometimes with specific definitions and, and sometimes interchangeably. Um, definitions of what it meant to be a bystander, ally, or advocate varied from paper to paper and, and program to program. Um, and in, indeed, some of the papers didn't provide an explicit definition. Um, so you see some just some key examples um, here from uh, different papers um, of bystander, ally, or allies, or advocates. And in the longer report, um, I provide uh, several more examples of the definitions used across different kinds of um, studies. 
So turning to research question two, um, this uh, scan ended up with 374 articles that were focused on allies and bystanders, again, outside of the faculty development literature. Um, the top three disciplines represented were violence prevention at 29%, psychology at 24%, and gender and sexuality studies at 13%. The top areas in which bystanders or allies were engaged were in the domains of violence or harassment reduction at 32%, LGBTQ equity and inclusion at 20%, gender equity and inclusion at 13%, and racial equity and inclusion at 12%. 8% of the articles explicitly engaged with intersectionality as a concept. And about 60% talked about engaging actors as allies and 40% used the term bystander. So before I go into some of the key insights that I gleaned from this review, I just wanted to note some limitations. Um, you know, these first and second uh, limitations that you see here are related to the scope of the review. Um, so through the scan, I realized that some of the studies that talked about what I would consider to be bystander strategies uh, use terms like confronting racism or um, intervening on behalf of homophobia um, or the like. And, and these studies kind of unevenly uh, use the word bystander or ally in their title or description, and so they were unevenly captured in my review. Um, likewise, there's a broader literature on how and why people take up so-called so pro-social or moral behavior. Um, so a key example here is there's a lot of work on, on why people donate to charitable causes. Um, and oftentimes they weren't specifically talking about participants in those studies in terms of being a bystander or an ally. So again, that literature was unevenly captured in the review, though of course I think there are insights that we could take from, from both of those bodies of literature. Uh, limitations three and four you note here, uh, noted here are more logistical in nature. So I focused on more recent studies, 2010 to present, um, mainly as a content management strategy, but it means that I missed some of the seminal yet older pieces in this area. And there was also a bias towards um, empirical pieces, uh, less emphasis on kind of conceptual or theoretical work. Um, so just limitations of, of my results. So in thinking about um, communicating results to the ARC network community, I pulled out five insights that I thought would be particularly interested, interesting um, to, to folks who have either engaged in this work or who are thinking about undertaking it. Um, and, and, you know, I'm happy to take questions on these uh, afterwards or, or any, any other things. Um, so the first insight, and it's probably the most obvious one, given the kind of conceptual framework that I used, is that we need to be more explicit in using intersectionality in our, in our ABA work. Um, so although there has been an increase in the empirical literature on allies, bystanders, and advocates in areas like hiring, in bystander development, and to some extent in leadership development, um, I, I observe that often the literatures are talking about ABAs engaging on racial equity and inclusion efforts or gender equity efforts or LGBTQ in inclusion efforts. Um, and, and so I think there's more opportunities um, for uh, these kinds of, of programs and the associated research to be in conversation with one another. Um, and, and, you know, I think that intersectionality really offers the opportunity to consider how and why strategies that work in some contexts don't work in others. Um, there's also a kind of growing recognition of this um, within, uh, the, within the research from folks who have uh, worked on ABA programs. Um, so for instance, uh, Anisha and colleagues at North Dakota State University um, reflected that the future of their allies and advocates program um, would need to operate with intersectionally driven assumptions about the future of the work um, and, and recognize that gender is a, is a multiplicity, not a dichotomy. Um, so, you know, my call is, is not unique. Many others who have been doing this work um, are, have, been, have made similar um, calls for action. Um, at the same time, uh, again, drawing from 
uh, some of the work, especially that's been coming out of some of the advanced programs that have been involved in, in bystander intervention work. Um, program developers note that there can be challenges in creating intersexually minded programs. Um, so for instance, Rose and colleagues at Florida International, Florida International University specifically embedded intersectional perspectives and scenarios um, that reflected intersectionality um, and, bar and, and barriers in, in their bystander leadership program. Um, and they noted as they looked at their internal evaluation data that there were gender and racial and ethnic differences in the responses to the workshop effectiveness. Um, as well as um, observed differences in the way that the workshop scenarios were received by different groups of faculty. Um, and so the author stated, we wrestled with delivering intersectional stories um, without reifying social constructs like gender, race, and cultural differences, and concluded that practicing intersectionality while teaching it um, to each other could make it difficult to facilitate effective workshops. Um, so, you know, in other words, the work of creating ABA programs with intersectionality in mind requires careful intentionality um, in terms of both the curriculum and the facilitation. Uh, a third insight shows the promise of intersectionality for understanding how issues of power and academic concept, context uh, might shape the behaviors of allies or bystanders in different domains. Um, so for example, Lyra's study of equity advocates who embedded with faculty hiring committees shows that it showed that an advocate's organizational role, um, so for instance, being a pre-tenure faculty member or being um, viewed as a kind of disciplinary insider outsider, shaped the extent to which they were viewed as a legitimate agent in, in, ad, in advancing um, racial equity in the search process. Um, similarly, another study outside of higher education by Peretz um, showed that men allies with different identities, um, in this particular case, um, straight men versus queer men, um, this uh, positionality shaped their pathway, pathways to allyship, their motivations for being allies, um, and the kinds of ways that they engaged um, as allies, so the kinds of actions that they took. Um, and so such results really provide important insight for considering how the strategies available to somebody are really going to differ based on their aspects of identity. Um, so then the next point is that I think my re results really underscored the importance of language for communicating and imbuing different kinds of power and privileges to groups that are being engaged as bystanders or allies. Um, so again, I think we really need to think about acting with intentionality as we're developing and studying these programs. Um, so for example, Patton and Bondi observed the critical importance um, of ongoing action for social justice allies. Um, so merely, you know, thinking about what are the actual actions um, and, and goals of folks that we think of as allies, and how are those different than the actions that we would observe in the so-called helping behavior of, of nice white men or, or nice white women, right? Um, and similarly, Carlson and colleagues in their review of of the allyship and activist literature um, observed that there's a need to find terminology which doesn't simply reproduce um, the oppressed versus privileged bina binary, um, while also recognizing and struggling with um, tension surface in the themes um, and not diluting the recognition of, of privilege. Uh, the last is an observation and a call to action. Um, so again, I, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, I know that there has been a proliferation of these different kinds of um, ally bystander advocate programs in the last five years. And yet, you know, there's still relatively liter little literature about the impact of these programs, the challenges and opportunities of and the challenges of, uh, and opportunities of this work for shaping individual and organizational outcomes. Um, so, you know, we need more research and it's an area that is prime for this. Um, and I encourage all of us to consider what it means to be, you know, kind of intersectionally driven and intersectionally minded as we engage in, in these kinds of work. Um, so that is uh, the conclusion of my formal presentation. I wanted to say thanks again to the ARC Network and the Research Advisory Board for their support of this work and feedback. 
Um, and I look forward to engaging you all during the Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I want to remind everyone that um, to please drop your, your questions into the chat and or the um, or into the Q&A. And we already have one question, so we'll go ahead and get started as people are adding in their additional questions. And this is actually from one of our cohort five virtual visiting scholars um, saying, I have found it difficult to publish intervention-based work, such as descriptions and evaluations of faculty programs. Can you give some examples of journals or other outputs where you found programmatic descriptions or evaluations in your lit search? Yeah, well, um, I, I haven't done this analysis, but my guess is that in that 28 articles um, that I included in my first research question, a good portion of them are in the advanced journal. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that that is an excellent um, place to start. Um, I, you know, I also... Some of the other work has focused on uh, has been published in some of the kind of diversity and in, in higher education related journals of diversity of higher education D journal of diversity in higher education um, and others. But I but I also think that there is you know a need for program developers to really think about um, places to to publish their results even if it's not. Um, you know, even if we're not drawing from the kind of um, normal, uh, traditional uh, intervention led data. So, you know, for example, the Journal of Women and Gender in Higher Education, they publish program descriptions, Journal of Diversity in Higher Education does as well. Um, so, you know, I think that there are opportunities to that. I also think that, you know, for those of us who are on editorial boards or who are serving as journal editors, thinking about ways to kind of capture um, the good programmatic work, you know, whether that's through case studies um, or other, um, you know, non-peer reviewed journal article submissions um, would be really helpful for disseminating this work. So those are some places to start, but also um, I think for folks um, who are in positions where they can um, shape what gets published, uh, that would be really helpful to all of us who are thinking about these issues on our campuses. And um, thank you. And I, and I also want to say that I failed to mention the actual virtual visiting scholar's name is Erin Winteroud. So thank you, Erin, for that wonderful question. Um, we have another question from Nicole Gehring saying, to what extent are the popular bystander programs such as at Florida International University, which you referenced, or power play at the University of New Hampshire, integrating any of these findings in their work. Um, for example, a bystander program could show the ways that men use intersectional identities as a call to action for allyship. Absolutely. Um, and so you, again, I referenced two of the studies, one of the ones at, at North Dakota and one of the ones at Florida International. And so, you know, I, I think that um, the papers there suggest that um, program developers are really trying to incorporate intersectionality into the um, program curriculum. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, I think that there is a lot more work and a lot more kind of good thinking on these topics that's happening that just hasn't come out um, in the in the literature yet. Um, and so, you know, I, I encourage us to to do that so we can really have those conversations. Um, I, I want to draw attention to the the Peretz at uh, 2017 study, um, and that researcher has done um, quite a few papers um, looking at kind of intersectional identities for for male allies and specifically how they're drawn into gender equity work. Um, and I think that those could be a really excellent kind of place for folks who are thinking about. Um, uh, you know, engaging men from different backgrounds in the work and also, but considering, um, you know, the kinds of um, ways in which those identities will then shape 
how they engage as allies, like how they feel comfortable engaging. Um, and, and so I think it could be really um, transformative for thinking about how we kind of are, are, you know, training and providing education and resources to those that we're imbuing uh, mm-hmm. or th- those that we're putting into those roles. So, um, you know, that that the, that series of papers I, I found to be um, really helpful for my own thinking. And I've, I've actively kind of thought about some of the findings from those papers as I've been um, re-engaged in this work, you know, as I mentioned, being back on campus and, and doing some of these workshops. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that might feed a little bit into sort of being expanded, um, uh, expanding your thought process, um, looking at Ezra Miller's question, uh, saying that a lot of measures of success for these types of programs seem like they're very short term. So mm-hmm. surveying workshop participants at the end of the workshop. Are there examples of ways folks have measured their impacts more long term? So I have not seen that um, in the literature in higher education. Um, I have had some ongoing conversations about the need to kind of link these kinds of programs and not, and not just this, you know, any kind of interventions or workshops that um, that faculty developers are providing to, you know, concrete changes and perfect in um, uh in perceptions of of the climate and of the culture of our organizations. And I think, um, so so no, but yes, please do that. Um, The other thing I will say is that I think that, you know, an intersectional perspective on those kinds of um, more longitudinal or long-term studies about the impact of this work would also be really helpful because um, you know, we want to shift kind of aggregate perceptions of the climate and the culture, but of course we want to understand that in a disaggregated way and understand um, if there are differences in the way that these programs are received um, for, you know, women of different racial and ethnic backgrounds, women for um, women of different, uh, you know, appointment types. And, and so I think intersectionality can be helpful for um, thinking about how to design those studies and speak to the kind of different ways that we might think about outcomes and impact. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be good to uh, move down and we're going to make sure that we get to as many questions as possible, but I wanted to um, bring uh, forward Susanna Rose's question from FIU, I believe, um, saying, thank you for your work on this topic. Our team is struggling with how to illustrate intersectionality in our bystander case studies. Participants and even team members often end up reducing the issues um, to either, sorry, the question (laughs) went away. (laughs) Um, I'm sorry, reducing the issues to either gender or race. For example, um, one of our cases involves a Pakistani woman who is being bullied by a male Pakistani colleague. Most U.S. faculty do not have a context for understanding that cultural issues may be affecting how she feels that she can respond. And we want to be sensitive um, for us not to provide a context that says Pakistani culture does not support gender equality. how do we do this without stereotyping? Yeah, um, and thank you for for your paper. I learned a lot from it. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about, and now I'm not remembering uh, uh, if this was in Dr. Goodwin's um, presentation or in another one, um, but I think it probably was <laughs> in Dr. Goodwin's presentation. Um, but ha- you know, I think that interactive theater can be really helpful for um, illustrating some of these issues because you can um, kind of redo the scenes and imagine, uh, and if you have enough actors and actors who are representing diverse positionalities, right, um, put in different people who hold different identities to show how these things then play out the impact, the reception um, looks a lot different um, depending on, on, you know, who is the perpetrator and who is the target. Um, And so I think that, you know, the interactive, some programs have been using interactive theater, some programs are using case studies, some programs are using videos. um, And, you know, of course, there are benefits and and drawbacks to any one of those methods. 
Um, but I think that the interactive theater piece can really help get at some of that um, kind of difference in positionality and, and bring out those issues in ways that, and, and I will say this about, you know, some of the own, my own work, you know, when I have used videos, it doesn't give you that kind of flexibility to respond to issues that come up in a workshop um, as you're doing it. Um, so that that's one of the things that I'm thinking about. Um, and, you know, I wish that we were in a in a bigger meeting so we could hear from others and because uh, I'm sure they have great thoughts, too. I, I'm absolutely certain. And we'll we'll try to to help and connect people with resources to kind of expand that conversation, too, because I think it's incredibly important. Um, I wanted to answer uh, Jerry Weinberg's question next that says, as an advocate at their institution, is there reading you have come across that you would recommend be included in ally in similar training sessions? Hmm. Well, you know, I mentioned the, the Peretz study, and I think that that could be really helpful insofar as, at least again, when I have done these workshops, um, you know, we're talking about bystander strategies. Often we're doing it in, you know, a short amount of time, and there may not be a lot of um, time for kind of critical <laughs> reflection from participants about how they may have engaged in this behavior um, or, or not, or the factors of their own positionalities, their own, um, you know, levels of power and privilege and how that might shape the reception of their work. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that having that, uh, using some of the work on kind of intersectionality and male identity could be helpful for facilitating a conversation among those who are, who are being trained in those areas to really reflect upon not just, you know, male privilege, but the, but the, the but the intersections of, of, um, male privilege in academia, STEM privilege, white privilege, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the you know the other piece of that is that the kind of extent to which programs are developed um, with that kind of critical reflection piece varies a lot. So um, again, I'll I'll just talk from my own experience. In my bystander program, we we come in, we're there for two hours. People learn a set of strategies, and you know we don't do a lot of follow-up to see um, if that has changed anything or if there was kind of any kind of critical reflection on, on behalf of participants who were in the room. Um, so, you know, I think that's a, a limitation of my own approach. And I do think that that kind of um, thinking about, well, is this a beginning conversation, a workshop part one that needs a workshop part two, do departments as they're thinking about engaging people as bystanders need to be engaged over the course of a year, or over the course of two years? And, and what are the benefits of, of looking at, um, uh, you know, kind of duration and, and quality of engagement um, could, again, be something that that shapes um, impact back to that question earlier. Mm -hmm. That was kind of a tangential uh, thought that I had there, but <laughs> no, I mean, it, it's great because, well, something that I think a lot about um, when the space for reflection isn't held, right, is we don't even get to deal a lot with the inspection of positionality. Um, we don't get to deal as much with sort of solidarity, which kind of says we can be an ally um, or an advocate even sitting in a marginalized place with someone else who might not have a quote unquote overlapping identity, but sometimes that reflection of how power is constructed in broader society and then in the community where we're operating like a department and then in that interpersonal relationship or interpersonal interaction that we might be acting as a bystander in, you know, when we don't have that reflection, I think that's also where we're seeing um, some people not uh, uh, I'd say evaluating their experience in the training differently, and then also evaluating how they feel empowered moving forward differently. Does that? Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, can I just add one more thing to that? Because it's just making me think about the the depth of engagement that is required to do that level of reflection to also, um, you know, build in opportunities for solidarity how that's going to look different in a group of 
all women or all women of color, as opposed to if you're situate if you're doing this workshop within your department, um, and if you're doing this workshop um, with department faculty and staff and graduate students. And like, there's just so many different ways where that is like deeper work, definitely more meaningful work. Um, but, you know, for all of us, one of the problems is, is scale and capacity. And so I think, you know, we we do a cost benefit analysis, right? Like, what do we want everybody to be doing? Um, and then what are things that, you know, if we if we were ideally creating these programs, we would then be able to do in the longer term? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I just want to remind people we um, we have a little bit of time left. So if there are like one or two questions that you haven't added to the Q&A and you're kind of um, hanging on to it, um, we've got some time as we answer um, a couple more. Um, an anonymous attendee sort of expanding on your bringing up, you know, when graduate students are in the room or, or other students are in the room. Um, says, how do you see the student professor power dynamic in the context of intersectionality? As a student, how can we improve faculty aware awareness of this power dynamic and encourage them to support ABA? Yeah, so I have done a lot of these workshops with departments and have encouraged departments to also invite not just graduate students, but also staff. And I think that um, especially for graduate students and for staff who maybe are not getting access to the kinds of DEI training that many, some faculty have access to, at least access to, right? Um, the kind of recognition that, oh, somebody knows that these biases are happening um, and is uh, is in front of the room reflecting them back to me um, was, I think, quite uh, revelatory. And, and because the faculty members were also um, in the room, I think it gave, uh, it opened up the possibility for, for graduate students and for staff to say, Yes, I have experienced this, and and I will say this that this is also true for for um, we on our campus we're professional track faculty, but for non tenure eligible faculty, um, you know we in in developing the scripts that I use on my campus, I it it's not very hard for me to come up with different instances of bias and microaggressions. I'm sure we can all think of them, um, but some of the ones that particularly seem to hit home are related to kinds of differences in how we refer to and treat um, tenured and tenure track faculty member compared to professional track faculty member compared to staff um, and the kinds of ways in which it becomes normalized to completely disregard people based on their, um, you know, uh, their employment type really. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think think that doing some of this work in those group settings can be very beneficial for raising awareness. Um, on the other hand, sometimes in those conversations, I worry that um, because we are highlighting differences in the ways that, for example, graduate students and faculty are treated. Faculty then feel as though it's only a student issue. And, and I think we see this all the time in DEI work, like faculty are more way more likely to engage if it's like on behalf of students and they're not talking about it as themselves as colleagues. Um, so, you know, I see benefits um, and drawbacks, theme of the day. Um, in, in engaging in both ways. Um, but I do think that it can be beneficial to have graduate students in the room as we're talking about these issues, if only so that they feel as though somebody has really seen um, that these that these issues do exist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, well, we have a we have a couple more questions. Um, one, I would, um, while we're sort of in this space of talking about the trainings themselves, I wanted to go ahead and ask a question from Beth Mitchnek, uh, another virtual visiting scholar. Y'all are just too awesome. <laughs> um, there's been pushback about impl implicit bias training. 
Um, what do you say to those critics about the value of ABA trainings? Yeah. Um, hi, Beth. Well, so, you know, I, I think that part, there's a, there's a lot of different pieces of pushback to implicit bias training, right? Like one is that it doesn't last in the long term. It's not linked to long term behavior change. Um, I think that we have all been to not very good, like pedagog, uh, you know, from a like teaching and learning standpoint, not very good DEI trainings. And so I think it's, you know, hard to say, um, I personally think that people have pushed back to like bad workshops, just like anything that is not, not very good. Right. Like, um, so I, I think that some of the, in, again, from my view, some of the reasons why people like the kind of bystander work that we've done on our campus is because it's interactive. Um, it allows people to engage. Um, I've tried to use some of what we know from, you know, uh, the scholarship of teaching and learning to really thinking about scaffolding, learning. Um, so we're not just um, really spending a lot of time enmeshed in the bias literature, of which there is a lot, um, but also talking about strategies, inviting people to share personal um, learning. To uh, um, So, you know, all of that is to say, I think that we can make workshops and training better such that the pushback is not, well, these are ineffective, um, but so that people can really talk about the, the impact and the results. On the other hand, I don't know if Beth was asking about the kind of larger pushback against DEI work in general, which I don't, you know, we have seven minutes and I don't know <laughs> if I'm the right person to talk about that, but, you know, I'm also aware that many of us are in that many of us are in contexts where there's a kind of uh, resistance to the work, which is different than a kind of like uh, questioning of it in general. So yeah, those are things that I'm thinking about. <laughs> Thank you. And um, um, Sue Rosser has a question um, regarding your research approach or your your literature, um, where most of the articles you found qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods in their approach? So in the non-higher ed literature, I would say it was a mix, but because a lot of the, as I mentioned, like a lot of the work is looking at bystander intervention trainings and typically bystander intervention trainings uh, among college students intervening to reduce um, uh, I, uh, violence, you know, sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, there is, I think, a kind of tradition of um, quantitative program, you know, kind of intervention research. And so um, I didn't code things that way, but my bet is that because that was a large um a critical mass of the literature, it probably skewed a bit quantitative. On the other hand, I think that when we were, if I looked more at the kind of ally development um, uh, progression of allies, those tended, may have been more qualitative, maybe more conceptual in nature. But that's a good question that I could go back to and, and look at. Thanks for that, Sue. Um, yes, thank you so much. You like another of our co <laughs> Um And we have a couple more questions, but um, we're we're getting close to closing. So I'll I will um if it's okay with the with the individuals asking, I'll kind of shorten them a little bit. And then if you just have like a really quick answer to each, um, that would be great. Um, one is asking about how to, um, any suggestions for increasing attendance by faculty and graduate students when workshops are held? Yep, get the support of the department chair or the dean and make the department chair or dean um, introduce you, um, attach it to a departmental meeting or a college retreat and, um, if not required, highly encouraged. And I think it also um, matters a lot. A lot of the times I think the department chairs and the dean can learn a lot from being there too. Mm -hmm. um, and so could you please point to some instruments or articles which measure quote unquote good effective DEI trainings? Ooh. 
you know, again, I think you, we need to be uh, specific um, in what we're thinking about when we're saying good or, you know, good in what way, good based on what, are we using climate surveys? Are we using program evaluation data? Um, so some of the studies um, that are referenced in my report about bystander inter interventions, um, I think, had good measures of program evaluation data, often about behavior change in the short term. Um, but there's not a lot of research about um, the impact of DEI training in the long term. So again, uh, lots, lots of work that could be done from folks in this room. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I want to take a moment to say thank you so much for sharing this incredible work and your amazing expertise, um, which if anyone doesn't know, absolutely similar to all of our scholars expands beyond the topic of their research projects with us. Um, and I also want to say to our audience and thank you for those amazing, amazing questions and thank you for joining us and thank you for supporting our virtual visiting scholar program. Um, also, we are so excited if you have not seen it yet that we have opened the call for proposals for the 2023 advanced equity in STEM community community convening, which will be held June 5th through 7th at the Washington Duke Inn in Durham, North Carolina. We are dropping the link for the convening site in the chat where you can view the call for proposals and other information. We've also dropped a QR code and a short link um, that'll take you directly to the call for proposals. Want to remind folks that that deadline is March 5th, 15th. So um, it's drawing near but we just are exceptionally excited to present more work from this community and to support this community engaging with each other as we all work to advance equity in STEM. I would like, we would love for you to provide feedback on your experience with today's webinar by completing the survey, which we have also dropped in the chat. And on behalf of our virtual visiting scholars and the rest of our team, thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you.